book of Romans chapter 6, and uh, today we'll begin reading at verse 1. We'll go down to verse 14. Romans chapter 6, beginning at verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lusts thereof, neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace." Our attention this evening will be uh, from verses 7 through 10 uh, in this passage that we've read. And, uh, and the title of my message this evening is on the subject of Dead to Sin, Alive to God. Dead to Sin, but Alive to God. Now Paul, as he writes under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is speaking of not natural death, but rather he is uh, he is signifying death in all of it, all of its extent, signifying the second death, the penalty that Christ suffered. And if we remember from the previous message and in our previous studies there, that. The analogy is that the old man is crucified with Christ. Therefore, we must not, we cannot, we should not, we will not serve sin. He that is dead naturally, uh, if, you, if, if, we, if we'll take the analogy here and consider it, that uh, where he's talking about death, he that is dead naturally is freed from the authority of those who formerly had authority over him. So, being that we were in Christ, the death of Christ was real, that it actually happened, he uses this event and shows us how that we are free from the bondage of sin. We saw this as it was pictured in the baptism. Now we see it as it is in the crucifixion, the death of Christ. When we look at natural death, we know that this is something that anyone can understand. I have walked through many cemeteries and uh, slavery and, 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 and bondage is something that is uh, 
part of our history here in, in America. And uh, one of the cemeteries that I came across uh, one time whenever I was in West Virginia, uh, it, was, uh, it was kind of interesting because the, the, the one part of the cemetery had normal stones, like you would see in any other cemetery, but then there was another part of the cemetery. The stones weren't so normal. They weren't very well marked. They were kind of crudely marked, actually. But uh, the sign said it was the slave cemetery. Now, slaves they might have been in this lifetime while they were alive. But one thing is for certain, once they were dead, they were no longer slaves. They were no longer in bondage. Their masters had no more dominion over them. In fact, Job brings this up in the book of Job chapter 3. Job and chapter number 3. I'm going to go back there for a moment. And if... If, 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 if we started where he begins his, uh, his speech here, uh, he, he, says, he says in verse 11, Why died I not from the womb? Why did I not give up the ghost when I came out of the belly? But if you skip on down to verse 19, he says, The small and great are there, and the servant is free from his master. Death levels the ranks of all people. Even the most dreadful master has no more privilege than his vilest servant. This is, this is where the, 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 the playing field gets leveled out. No one is rich or poor. No one is bond or free. But all are equal. And so, Paul is presenting the argument here, not just in physical death, but in the death of Christ. The child of God is no longer in bondage to sin. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, First Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 6, Therefore let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be Sober. There is a difference. Between. The child of God. And the people of the world and that's not even the verse that I really wanted but but uh, Let's try 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 6. Sorry about that. 1 Timothy 5 and verse 6. It says, But she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth. This is the one I wanted. 
So we find that the people of the world, they are, they are living in pleasure. And they're, they're spoken of as being dead while they live. You see that all the time. People living in sin, maybe even seemingly having a good life. The Bible says that they are dead while they live. Morally dead, spiritually dead, in bondage to sin. On their way to an eternal hell. But you and I, we are different than that. We are dead in Christ. Dead to sin, free from sin. And so... The Bible uses these terms, but we must understand what they mean and how, the, how they're used. And so it is that we must die in Christ before we can live, before we can really begin to live. We saw previously the old man must be crucified. That's what he's talking about when we talk about dying in Christ. The old man must die. Dying to sin and this newness of life, these are are inseparable. In fact, if you have one, you've got the other. If you've got, if you've got this death to sin, if you've got the newness to life, if you have one, you've got the other. You can't have one without the other. It's like two sides to the coin. These proceed from the same work of regeneration. And both come from the same cause. And that cause, of course, is not some work that you've done, not because of your righteousness, not because of how great you are, but it is because of union with Jesus Christ. Now, there are folks out there who will put on a great show. And we, we see those things. And in fact, we find that the Bible speaks about these things People who, who pretend to do good, but unless sin be mortified, unless the old man be crucified, it is nothing more than just a covering of loathsome lust. And the Bible tells us that even our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. Even Adam and Eve, when they sinned in the Garden of Eden, they tried to cover themselves up with fig leaves. That wasn't enough. So many folks are trying to go through life with their own fig leaves. James chapter 4 and verse 8. James chapter number 4 and verse 8 says this. Draw nigh to God, and He will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners. Purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Over in the book of Matthew, chapter 23. Matthew, chapter 23, verses 25 through 28. Notice what's, what it says here. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you may clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. Even so ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. And then over in the book of Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11 and verse 44. Woe 
unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye are as graves which appear not, and the men that walk over them are not aware of them. So the Bible talks a lot about those who would try to appear very nice, very good, without actually having mortified the flesh, without actually having been covered by the blood, without actually having repented of their sins. The reality is, according to our text there in Romans, we cannot, we, we must die before we can live. In, the, in, in, in our text there in Romans chapter 6, that old man must be crucified. Romans chapter 6, verse 7, For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now don't misunderstand this. That word freed, this, this word freed, being freed from sin doesn't mean that we're freed from the burden of sin. It doesn't mean that we're freed from the warfare of sin. It doesn't mean that we're freed from the daily struggle of sin. Understand that there will always be these things. It doesn't mean that we won't have slips and falls throughout life. But what he is talking about here is our justification. In fact, the Greek word that is used here is translated 38 out of the 40 times in our scriptures being justified or justification, having something to do with justification. Justification of course, very simply stated, is that judicial act that frees the sinner from the penalty of the law through the righteousness of Jesus Christ. It's a word that we've defined time and time again in this series. So understand what he means by being freed from sin. There will be no sinlessness in this life uh, as far as being totally freed from sin. Now once we're in heaven, once we're with the Lord in, the pre in His presence in heaven, we'll be freed completely from the presence of sin, but that's not going to happen yet. Verse number 8, it says, Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with Him. We who have been born again, those of us who have been saved, we are one with Christ in His death, and we have this prospect of ever being with Him, alive forevermore. And we can say with Paul that we will be with him forever. I, I believe that's what he means here. In fact, I, I can say with great certainty because he uses that term, that phrase, oh, we believe. Uh, if you notice there, uh, in, in verse 8, he says, we believe that we shall. These are future tense things. He's talking about a future life. Uh, I don't believe he's simply speaking of, the, of, of our spiritual life. It would be unnatural to interpret it that way, although there are some commentators who do. Uh, but, uh, but to say we believe is a matter of faith. Looking for something that's not quite there yet. Although we need to realize something as we consider this. 
that our spiritual life and our eternal life are one. You see, one of these days, we may very well die. In fact, in fact, the statistics are pretty high that we will. Uh, ten out of every ten people die in this world. Uh, it's just a, it's just a fact. If if we look at the statistics, and 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 we consider the obituaries and and, and our experiences and all those things, ten out of every ten people die. Now, one of these days, those statistics are going to change because. Jesus Christ is coming back and he's going to rapture his people up out of this world. And so there's going to be some of us who are going to escape death and, 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 and not have any physical death at all. And I believe that could be very soon. And there may be some of us who very well could be raptured up out of here without seeing death. But even if we do, even if we do face death... I'm talking about physical death now. Uh, and, and our bodies are laid in the grave and all of that. The reality of death for the child of God is this. And that is that physical death is simply just a passing from this present life into the next. I don't believe there's any kind of soul sleep or anything like that. In fact, I believe it's going to happen very, very quickly. Uh, and, and, and I believe we'll be translated immediately up into heaven and, 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 and all of those things. Uh, we find it. Um, the Bible gives us some, some very clear uh, pictures of how that's going to be. Uh, Lazarus where, where Jesus is talking about the rich man and Lazarus, the angels came and, 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 and um, he was trans translated there. And then, uh, and then we find that uh, when the Bible tells us about the rapture, we find that it it's in a moment, the twinkling of an eye. I believe death happens in that same way. My point is this, those of us who are dead in Christ, we have no reason to fear physical death. We have no reason to, 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 to fear the unknowns of death because really when we get into the scriptures, the only unknown that we have is how we might die. But we know that we are with Christ all the way through it. And we know that we shall, as he puts it here, we shall also live with him. If we be dead with Christ... We believe that we shall also live with Him. I believe that you and I, who have been saved by the grace of God, we can be just as sure of this as Paul was. This was no mere speculation. This was no mere opinion. This was not a hope so or maybe so kind of thing. This was a surety with Paul. And I believe that this is a surety with us. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, Second Timothy chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, It is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, using the same terminology he's using here in our text in Romans, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. Paul was sure of this thing, and he was writing under the inspiration of the Spirit. 
Uh, this wasn't some wild speculation. This was the. This is the inspired word of God in Philippians chapter three. Philippians chapter three. And oh, by the way, not only are we going to. Uh, live with him, but we are also going to reign with him. Uh, I'm sure that uh, we're going to live with him, and I'm also sure that we're coming back and we're going to reign with Christ in a literal reign. Uh, and, uh, you know, we can be sure of these things. In, 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 in Philippians, It has escaped to my Bible. Philippians chapter 3, and there it is. And verses 20 and 21. For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Our conversation is in heaven. Why? Because we are citizens of heaven it's sure he's jesus is going to change our vile body uh, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body as sure as we are that jesus lives so we know that we will live also with him in romans chapter six there you know, some people they're looking for they're looking forward to retirement. They're looking forward to 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 this or that, whatever. I'm I'm looking forward to heaven, I, and and I and I think that all of God's people really ought to be looking forward to that. There's a lot of unsurety. Uh, there's a lot of things that we're not sure about with uh, with retirement. There's a lot of things we're not sure about. Uh, in this life, but I can tell you what, we can be sure of heaven. We can be sure that, that, that Jesus is, has prepared a place for us. We can be sure that we will live with him. In Romans chapter 6 there, verse 9, Knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. Even as Christ was raised from the dead, and he'll never die again, neither will we who have died and risen in him. So there's two different ways that we can look at this, and, uh, and, and, and we will. But... Um, First thing we want to consider is that after the resurrection, the believer will never die again. These bodies, they're not going to die again. And, 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 and we, we see this, we see the example in Christ. And um, notice the words, death hath no more dominion over him. This implies, and this shows us that death did have dominion over him. Christ. Not that it was the usurper. Not that not that Christ was somehow powerless. Uh, but uh, but he willingly gave up his life for us. Always remember that. And 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 and, and death once had dominion over Christ. He was its lawful captive, but only because he took our place willingly and bore our sins. But only, only for a time. Only for a time. Because after a time, Three days, three nights, Jesus rose from the dead, conquering not only death, but also hell and the grave, being declared by His resurrection to be the Son of God with power. In His resurrection, 
You and I who are saved, we receive the effect of His death in satisfying divine justice while making full atonement for our sins, rising from the dead, we have a pledge for our own resurrection to life and immortality. If you go back to the book of John, chapter 14, John chapter 14 and verse number 19, Yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more, but ye see me, because I live, ye shall live also. Who was it that wrote the song, Because He Lives, I Can Face Tomorrow? I believe it's Bill Gaither, but maybe not. But this is the truth of it. Because I live, ye shall live also, Jesus says. We have a hope that no one else in the world has because Jesus Christ. In this we also see our spiritual death is answerable to the death of Jesus so that and, and so our spiritual life must be answerable to his resurrection from the dead. We have a copy and a pattern for the mortifying of sin in his death, and we have a copy and a pattern for the newness of life in his resurrection. In this. And so then, if we go back to Romans chapter 6, Verse 10, we kind of begin to bring this to a close here. It says, For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Jesus Christ suffered the penalty of sin and ceased to bear it. There on the cross, Till his death, he had sin on him, though it was not his sin. It was not sin that he had committed personally, but he owned it because he took it upon himself. He did this. He did this for one reason and one reason only. Why in the world would anybody do that who was innocent? who had no sin, but he did this so as to free his people from its guilt. He did this so as to take the place, you and I, to suffer the hell that we deserved. But he only had to do this once. Only one time. In the book of Hebrews chapter 9, Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 12. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Verse 26. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of this world. But now once, in the end of the world, hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Verse 28, So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. And unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Chapter 10, in verse 10, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Verse 14, For by one offering he hath perfected 
forever, ever, them that are sanctified. Kind of get the idea that this was one time. Jesus, and praise God, this is the truth. Jesus doesn't have to come back for every generation. Jesus doesn't have to be sacrificed every so often. The sacrifice, His death on the cross, it doesn't have to be repeated. We see the perfection of His satisfaction. There needs not to be another sacrifice to abolish sin. But you know what else we see? We begin to see how Paul's argument is working here. In Romans chapter 6, remember what the, what the argument is all about here. The argument is the answer to the question. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Verse 10, For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, verse 11 says, Reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Being raised, he dieth no more. Children of God, let us fix and settle our hearts and minds on this truth. That like is Christ, only died once to sin, to pardon the iniquity of His people. So it is that you and I will not return to our old bondage. Have we, though, seen people who seem to always be dying and rising and dying and rising? What I mean is that they return, that they, they seem to, maybe they make a profession of faith, and then after a while they return to their, to their sinfulness, lick up their vomit, so to speak. And then after they're clean, they go right back and wallow in the mud, right back where they came from. To be repenting of sin and then returning back to it and then repenting and then returning back to it is to show that the repenting is not true repentance at all. Proverbs chapter 24 and verse 11. Proverbs 24 and not what I meant to write down there as well. I apologize. But true repentance 
is a thorough change of heart and life. And therefore to repent and then to go on sinning is no sound repentance. Perhaps we've seen it in the lives of people around us. Perhaps we've seen some who claim to be able to lose their salvation and then gain it again and then lose it again. The Bible doesn't teach such things. Perhaps we've seen it even in churches that we've been members of where someone joins the church and all of a sudden they leave the church and never come back. They've gone back right where they were before they were saved, before they made the profession. Death has no dominion over us. So, neither should sin have dominion over us. The child of God will persevere until the end. And that's what Paul is teaching us. That's what the scripture is telling us here. In the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, these things are what we are finding out here. Now, as we go through this, we'll find some practical things about this further. But I'll end with this. It's not that we're any better than anybody else. Because we're not. Remember Romans chapter 3 told us just how wicked and evil everybody is, Jew and Gentile alike. Praise God for the victory that we have through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who died on the cross for the sins of His people. Praise Him that our old man is crucified with Him. That that old man, that old body of sin might be destroyed. That henceforth we should not serve sin. Praise the Lord that we've been freed from sin. And that if we are dead with Christ, we shall live with Him. That death hath no more dominion over us. And that now there's a new king that we serve. It's not the old sin that we served before, but God. Thank God for His grace, His mercy. And for the truthfulness of this, as it's presented here in Romans chapter 6. Brother Ray, would you please pray for us? Father, we thank you for this day and for all your blessings. And Father, just uh, the blessings of this one day, Lord, how innumerable they are, how good you are to your